is Shannon Chance, um, who's a Fulbright Scholar visiting us at the moment in DIT. Um, and Shannon is going to um, give a paper that she delivered in the ARG conference in Limerick about two weeks ago. that 
knowledge is useful for achieving things, for something quantifiable. Um, and you'll see that, you'll think that it's um, also for meeting other people's expectations. But along the way, you start to have a richer, deeper understanding of it, where you're realizing that you build knowledge so that you can contribute to society and you can meet your own internal standards of excellence. And then along the way, you start to realize, wow, I can actually build knowledge myself, right? I can build and contribute, just as in, in the way that Sean was talking about, for instance, or the way the fifth year students who Anna's working with are constructing new things um, through the act of writing. They're constructing new architectural artifacts, but they're also constructing new, brand new ideas. They're constructing brand new knowledge. So, um, the paper that I showed there at, at the beginning was actually about um, writing and how architecture professors can use writing, just as Anna is, to help students um, through the design process. And it talks a lot about the benefits that have been documented for um, having people write. So I'll just go through a few of these um, to give you a little taste for the justification behind the idea that architecture professors should get you to write. So Clark said that, um, Educators can initiate this type of transformation that I'm talking about by um, prompting students to write, to imagine, and to exchange ideas, talk about ideas. Um, researchers have found that actually hands-on studio-based courses, when combined with writing, promote met metacognition, which is thinking about how we think, getting students to think about how they think, and self-regulated learning. And these are things that we want and expect architecture students to be able to do, but we don't expect those necessarily in other majors. So the whole point of this research is to figure out how we can tap, we can draw from what's happening in architecture school that's very effective and help bring that to other areas, like, like I've seen happening in engineering here, and I'm gonna show you that in a minute. Um, so journaling, this act of writing, whether it's in a blog form, which I will also show you, or um, handwritten, helps facilitate critical thinking, deep learning, and purposeful design, and reflective judgment. These are things that the scholars have said along the way. Um, and that it can also be a very important piece of getting people to help restore their lives, you know, construct what they want to be, design their own lives, um, and also design a way of being in the world. Now this isn't just something that happens in architecture. A lot of other professions are using this too, such as um, social work. A lot of social work is asking students who are out in the field um, doing like their study abroad or their internships to really think about what they're doing, use it in another way, share it maybe through blogging. Um, that's happening here in the nursing school. Um, but basically help bridge the theory that they're learning with what they're seeing in the field and transfer, transfer that, that understanding back and forth. Um, so of course we know that in architecture this looks different than it does in many other fields, right? There are notes. How many of you made a sketch when Anna asked you to, 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 draw, to write about a wall? Did anybody? I, well, I started with a sketch and then started to write about that experience of being um, inside that, and she happened to say the, the word well, you say well? Well, so, you know, but you go so fast. She's famous for her speed. Um, um, so anyway, I wrote about the wall in, in Orvieto, the well. The wall of the well in Orvieto. Um, but you know, we skip back and forth between note making, drawing, annotating sketches, uh, measured drawings. And um, we also go back and forth between actually identifying what the problem is and solving the problem, you know? In architecture, we know we don't get a clear-cut problem. And this is something that they're trying to break down in engineering because they have been teaching engineering as if problems are well-structured and as if engineers will go into the field knowing what the problem is that they need to solve and then just needing to come up with the answer. And we know that in architecture, you, you rarely know what the actual problem is until you get in there, right? That's the terror of the writing that Sean was talking about, but of the design itself. And that's why being a first or second year architecture student is so terrifying at first and then so liberating when you realize that it's like jumping out of an airplane and just you know, floating to the ground, that something great happens that you discover in the process and you'll just let yourself fall through the air. So um, this type of work has
has been something that architecture firms have already always done. They've used a continuous processing of layering, copying, and tracing information, which I definitely was in architecture school with a lot of translucent paper. Now we do it in a different way with these layers that you turn on and off, on and off, um, moving back and forth between Photoshop and, and AutoCAD and whatnot. And of course, this whole process helps students to learn how to use and manage representational tools and communicate design ideas. But also, there's something really important that happens if you're doing a good job at this. You're also keeping records of what you've been through, of the thoughts that you've had, so that you can go back. It helps you get a more synthesized idea, I think. And I think we're going to see that when we hear more from the students that the writing helps them come to a stronger sense of what it is they're trying to achieve and bringing all the parts together. <clears throat> but also in a way that makes it easy if you've documented things well that you can go back. So I always recommend that you don't just start an AutoCAD file and just keep going and going and going. And keep saving it with different version numbers so you can always go back. Or writing files the same way. So you can go back and cultivate those little bits and fragments that Anna talked about being kind of left behind. I do the same, and I'm also a pack rat. Um, so we talked about synthesis, promoting synthesis, but it's also another way to get engaged with what you're doing and to really think about it at deeper levels. So, and just quickly, um, if you're not spending a lot of time thinking in this way, sort of with words, you probably are leaving some things out. You know, a good decision-making cycle will include doing, feeling, <coughs> watching, and thinking. And it runs around the outside. And students typically come into school really comfortable with one of these ways of thinking. Um, and in order to make good decisions in architecture, you need to be able to negotiate the way through all of these. We learn that quickly in architecture school. You won't get into second year if you haven't learned to negotiate the basics, but it's not the case in other majors, and so we're trying to figure out um, why that is. So, um, I'm going to show you now a little bit of some writing that's been done that exists out there in the world. This is from a class at the University of Michigan, and it's a class, it's a design class that includes um, architecture students, art and design students, and material sciences engineers. Now, the engineers have never had a design studio in their life. Most of these are junior or senior students, and they're working together in teams of six, with two students from each discipline, um, and a professor from each discipline. And they're asked to keep blogs, or they're required to keep a blog that records what they're doing. But it's a way of getting the students to really think about what they're doing and reflect on it. And, um, they're asked at the beginning to do something that seems utterly unclear. So one year it was to, the course is called Smart Surfaces, um, and it's part of a larger suite of courses that University of Michigan has that are um, team-taught interdisciplinary classes, courses. But in this case, they were asked to, to, to design um, heliotropic smart surfaces. The teams were. These are heliotropic smart surfaces. The next year they were designing um, biomimetic smart surfaces. So of course there's a lot of time spent trying to figure out what that means and how they will accomplish it. Now they have resources that you cannot even believe. Um, <clears throat> now what I'm trying to do is take these texts and look to see um, how they're approaching design and how they're um, developing with regard to epistemological understanding. Um, and so the design one is pretty easy. Here's the design strategies rubric that I find to be very helpful, especially in working with uh, first and second year students, helping them develop prowess at design. So on the left hand side, well the middle column, but left hand side you see a description of what beginning designers will normally do at each stage of the design process and what more informed designers will do. Not necessarily expert designers, but um, so let's just zoom in here during the, when you're first given a challenge, um, typically beginning designers will start making decisions immediately, um, they'll skip the research altogether, and any investigations that they do will kind of be haphazard. Um, whereas informed designers will delay their decision until they've really explored the issue, try to figure out what it is they're actually trying to solve. They'll do research and they'll seek out information 
and they'll do tests to help them understand if they're going in the right direction. Now that meshes pretty well with the theories that Perry has, and it's this overlap that really fascinates me <coughs> when I'm trying to assess by looking at the blogs. So, um, and as I, just to mention that, um, I said that Perry wasn't the only one, so you've got all of these people, these rows, are all different people who study the same basic thing, and they come up with different categories, but they all pretty much jive. And what I think is really neat is that the upper level of um, skill here, the words that all these theorists have used to describe it, they're all architecture sorts of words, contextual, constructed, trans-system, cross-categorical, and generative knowing, really creating things. Um, or to put it a little bit more simply, um, at, at the level of dualism, students will think that design is very linear. I do one step, two step, three step, it's over. Um, whereas um, more advanced students will see that, oh, okay, I've got to go through this cycle and look at these different ways. But then, really strong students, you know, this is where you, where you need to be when you get out of um, the foundation level, I think is where you understand that it's a process, an iterative process, where you're always mixing new ideas in and revisiting things that you've already got. And that's where the record keeping comes in handy because you go back and, and pull some things forward. So, now to show you a concrete example, um, I've meshed these two charts up. I, this is color coded, so each one of those theorists that I just showed you has contributed to this in various ways. Uh, I brought them together, and um, now I'm looking at the blogs that the students wrote to see if I can tell things about what, how they're changing. Now, most of the um, students who come in to this class who have had design studios do very well. They do, in fact, reflect high-level thinking, which is great, because the theorists, the reason I got involved in this is because the theorists say that most undergraduate students don't reach that highest level, don't cross over this line during undergraduate years, and I'm like, the architects do. Um, so I was basically looking for a way to prove that, right? Um, but I also wanted to find out what it's like to cross over that line and um, how we can help other students do that, right? I mean, I really thought that um, the architecture professors are talking to you from across this line, from first year when you walk in, and they don't really speak down to you. They ask you to come up over over the line and think contextually from the beginning. Whereas the theorists say, we need to guide people along carefully, you know, and you should never like force them. But you know, architecture school kind of drags you on your face through these sometimes, you know? Um, so I've just zoomed in here to show you what the highest level of development would look like um, for that beginning stage. So the student plunges into exploration and embraces process of design as a means for generating new ideas. You know, that take the pain because you know something great is going to come out of it in the end, like Sean was talking about. Um, hold off on making decisions, we talked about that one. Um, but look at the blue one, reflects personal integration of information based on rational inquiry. Um, so the person is actually letting their own intuition and the things that they know inform that. They're treating what they know as knowledge. And they're seeing their own ability here in red, to generate, produce, author, or originate their own truths, basically, their own lives, their own constructions. So let's look at what an engineering student said. This is really fascinating, because the engineering student hadn't had a design studio before, and started out really at that level of, well, there are multiple points of perspective, but that means everything's opinion and anything goes. So he, what he says is in yellow, and you see, He's working on a team design and he's very frustrated. The progression was not without its dilemmas. Our group became puzzled by function. He's just had enough. Many an hour was lost to debate of the purpose of things. And if you keep going on, you see, but let us not forget the forms that did not survive the past few days. His idea didn't make it and he was bitter. But along the way, something magic happened. So I was so excited when I found moments like this in their texts. He said, it, this is about a program called Rhino. I decided to learn Rhino, taking any chance I could learn from the architecture and art and design majors. To each, I am very grateful. And I learned how to put simple shapes 
together as best as I, as best I could. But I was learning how to create, and it felt exhilarating, much more alive and enticing than anything the College of Engineering has thrown my way. As engineers, we learn theory, and theory is a clear divorce from practice. It is silly we even entertain the title of engineer. We are not good with our hands, nor are we good at innovation. We learn how to solve problems that have already been solved. Innovation only spews force from blah, blah, blah. Um, it's, it's really neat to see that he starts to see the creative process as liberating and um, realizing that he wasn't creating. He was just thinking he could plug things into a formula before, basically. Um, but, but that through this exchange with people who had been through design studios, he was able to open up and start to see that he could create. Now this is being achieved here, particularly in the electrical engineering program, um, but in a lot of the programs where they're using problem-based learning to teach engineering, um, like product to design, for instance. So my goal is to help tie this together, to, to help bring some of the things you're doing in architecture to a, a, a broader group. Now, how am I doing for time? And 20 okay, um, so I'm going to wrap it up. This is one of the um, architecture <laughs> students here who um, was clearly all in, in this column. Um, and a lot of the architecture students were all, all at the high level of um, not just design thinking, but also being able to think contextually. Um, so I will. I'm going to be here for a bit of the seminar, but then I'm running across to Kevin Street because I'm, I'm going to talk to students who are going to let me interview them about these issues so they can kind of get a different perspective from just looking at the things they've written, but also go in and ask them questions for the ones who have been through this kind of education. So I thank you for letting me, part, me be part of your day and um, look forward to the question and answer period. Judged, these shadowy thoughts must be brought into light of reason, 
and the echoes of St. Trace to their sources. So in preparation for the move to a 3 plus 2 architecture education system, we've introduced the architectural design dissertation. It was designed specifically to bring these shadowy thoughts into the light of reason, take places both synthesis and analysis at the heart of the student experience in the second semester. Traditionally, the architect's studio, which was an apprenticeship model, was modernized by the Bauhaus. House. It remained, however, <coughs> largely a master-apprentice relationship. Our initiative provides a method by which the student may become masters of their own work. And by this point in their career, completed, they have completed a body of work which can be used as a foundation for their reflection, tracing it back to its source. The topic is introduced via comparative analysis of an established architect's work. The student begins to see in that work through various analytical lenses the consistencies. The twin tools of drawing and writing are used to distill the essence of the work to establish the source of the echoes. Drawing itself is not alone or may not be sufficient. Neither, however, are words as they are merely spoken. The act of writing, therefore, is a discipline akin to drawing may be applied loosely or with the precision of the knife. In the analysis, the students have found that most architectural writing, however, has been wielded with tools often lacking this precision. Published documentation of these established architects is often woefully incomplete or smothered in aphorisms. Most are confined to ideas, giving little to eliminate the source. And like drawing, writing must have a purpose and should not rest until the task is fulfilled. Milan Kunder, in his book, The Art of the Novel, provides us with his own warning to himself. He says, my disgust for those who reduce the work to its ideas, my revulsion at being dragged into what is called discussion of ideas, my despair at this era they fall by ideas or with ideas and indifferent to works. Ironically, this is a sort of defense of Shane de position, but concentrating on the fact that the work is the important thing not the words. The temptation for students is to repeat this error, to copy that which has preceded them. The only antidote to this is to follow the material, utilizing the tools of our trade to distill, observe, dissect, parse, and finally explain. It requires a broader understanding of culture and knowledge of things. The narrow confines of architecture education somehow isolates the students from the world in which they live, from which all things come. Writing is a way of reconnecting with the world, bringing light to the shadows. Each student is tasked with a design dissertation that shadows their design process. It's a series of definitive, reflective elements requiring the student to monitor and report on various uh, aspects that make up this process. The completion of the dissertation requires that the student take ownership of the process, determining in sequence the theme of their investigation, the appropriate vehicle for that investigation, the appropriate context for the exploration and the resolution of the problem. Each element is interwoven into a final dissertation. It is hoped then that they will become the foundation for their own future development, and it is hoped that the act of writing will be a less fearful enterprise, where shadowy thoughts are brought into the light of reason. Thank you. First of all, then UCD, and then you well, are sort of recent graduates of the Brother Brothers and students. Um, and the first speaker is Anna Christ, um, <coughs> graduated last year from, from DIT. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Anna, and um, I just graduated from DIT this year, and I'm going to speak a little bit about um, how writing influenced my thesis and how the writing process. And became a tool to enable me to um, create a much more um, powerful project, I think. And so what happened was, in the beginning of fourth year, we were expected to um, discover or find and develop our own architectural theory. And we did this by writing a short dissertation. And then in fifth year, we got the opportunity to continue this, um, this idea and explore it um, in writing as well as through building our own architecture or designing our own architecture. Um, and for me, um, the writing was really the starting point um, 
all of my, my project really came from my idea and my writing. And being able to write allowed me to kind of explore what my theories were, and I wasn't really sure at that time what they were, and everything was kind of a bit up in the air, and writing really allowed me to kind of get everything out. And um, I think writing it down and getting it on paper kind of clarified for me what my, what my own philosophy was. Um, so, it allowed, yeah, so I suppose it allowed me to kind of dissect that idea and nurture it in a way as well. Um, writing then became a medium by which I could express and explore my ideas, um, and it also became a useful design tool. Um, it, was a, it was a technique through which I could verbalise my thoughts and express my ideas in a way that I had never really been challenged to do before. In a way, it was a new approach, um, I think for a lot of us it was a new approach, and by using language rather than images, and drawings um, to, to relay our points of view as opposed to images. So it became a different way of thinking about architecture. Um, images, I find, have certain ambiguity and they have an allure as well, especially for people like us who are so enamored by images and we use them quite a lot. So um, it was good to have another way of looking at something. And actually my topic for my thesis was architecture and illusion. And this explores the notion that when we look at an image, we project our own thoughts, emotions, and desires onto that image. So in a way, we see ourselves in the image. And for the same reason, it's a lot easier to, and often tempting to hide behind the vagueness and lore of an image. But writing forces us to make decisions to clarify in black and white, in text, and um, words that are the dialogue open to interpretation in the same way that images are. So I suppose the main advantage of writing um, was that it, it forced me to clarify my idea. Um, I wrote mainly for myself, and um, it allowed me to structure my thoughts and it kept me on track, stopped me from straying off point. Um, and it also it was an outlet for my thoughts, whether they were good or bad, it was a way of getting everything out and a way of identifying um, what ideas were actually worth thinking about. Because a lot of the stuff that I came out with was, was not so good, but a lot of it was, and I was able to sift through it um, and structure my thoughts. Um, I could also critically examine other architects and their theories, and from that I could discover my own point of view. And then it enabled me to say, you know, confidently that I have researched this, I know what I'm talking about, this is what I believe, and I have this text to back it up. This is what other think, people think, this is what I think. Um, so it wasn't just drawings. You, you didn't have to stand up and, and have an image that could be interpreted in many ways. You had a point of view, and when you have a point of view, it's easier to, to design from that point of view. Um, and also, so I suppose it shed a different light on my ideas. Um, it made me think about them in a different way. And uh, often when you write something down, I found it often leads to another thing and then another thing and then another thing. And I use it in conjunction with my design, so if I got stuck with something, I was able to, to write and dispose them together and to develop my, my, my design, because obviously the design is the most important, the most important aspect, the final, final, final design is the final work that you have, but um, the writing um, just makes it, it backs you up, basically you don't have to, you, you can, you can, it backs you up, that's the main thing really. Um, so, yeah, by using two different means of, of, of signing, um, for it, using words and drawing, um, I was able to come up with something I thought was, so it was quite okay in the end. I think my, my architecture wasn't, didn't catch up with my idea quite well, but at least I knew where I was trying to go with it. Um, and so yeah, I think that people should use their words if they can, you know, if you like to draw, but I think that if you can um, use both, then use as many tools as you possibly can um, in the design process. Um, and using all our resources will make the building better, I think.
When I gained promotion my, my thesis, I will carry with me for the rest of my architectural career. Uh, I did not leave only with an architectural project, but a whole new way of thinking about architecture. So writing is, is probably fairly unremarkable, or and I probably shouldn't say that with the number of cheers in the crowd, but um, I suppose it's not something that I suppose I felt personally even kind of even came up until the kind of crunch came with dissertation in fifth year. And uh, but I suppose these kind of things force you to, to do what you have to do, and um, and there's a kind of um, I suppose. Yeah, it was a pretty, pretty good, um, pretty good experience overall. And um, what I have here is, uh, it's probably not, not right in many ways, but uh, it's just some of the like, this kind of rules or, or lessons I've kind of picked up along the way as I kind of did write and continue to write and somehow get employed even to write. So, um, my own understanding of writing and its relationship to architecture is, uh, is perhaps based on a, a broader concept of media in general, um, most of which is influenced by, if not wholly derived from, uh, Marshall McLuhan's understanding media. Uh, in this book, McLuhan famously declares that the medium is the message. Uh, definition here is key for McLuhan. A medium is really any human invention or technology that shapes and controls the scale and form of human association and action. This can include roads, clocks, money, architecture, and of course, writing. For me, McLuhan's work has an extraordinary equalizing tendency. Uh, previously divergent developments such as planes, electricity, and books suddenly sit side by side under the heading of media. Crucially for the architect and for the topic of this symposium, it means writing can be equated to drawing. And I suppose I mentioned this since it Sometimes feels that during our education as architects, the importance of language is ignored in favour of drawings and indeed other uh, image producing uh, media such as photography. Uh, yet, there are some fundamental differences between the nature of language and image. Uh, each have their own set of rules, each limit what can be communicated, each construct their own reality. Significant also is that in this context, alongside drawing and writing, Architecture itself becomes a medium. It too constructs its own reality, like the media upon which it relies for its representation and reproduction. At the root of architecture is an actual process of thought, which is in itself non-verbal and non-visual. Yet if a process of thought is best and most clearly expressed in the medium of architecture, then any attempts to translate this work into other media will inevitably appear superfluous and inferior. The only possibility is to avoid any attempt at reiterating the original content and instead consider the text or image as an independent body of work. McLuhan's definition therefore liberates the architect from the potential tyranny of drawing, allows for broader avenues of thought to be explored through other media, and justifies the use of a medium based on the message to be communicated rather than a content that is to be reproduced. This might be the space for writing for this might be the space for writing and architecture. Um, writing is not a synonym for language. Writing is a medium and language is a content which, is, which itself can be spoken, written or printed. 
Each of these formats are fundamentally different in how they might determine our conception and perception of an architecture. Um, whoops. Um, anyway, last summer, so I suppose this kind of realization kind of slowly dawned on me as I uh, prepared for this uh, workshop that I did uh, called Writing is Building, which was part of uh, last year's uh, YASA, uh, I guess, summer school in Helsinki. And um, it was an idea for exploring writing and architecture originally, and it grew, I suppose, to encapsulate other forms of media to do a language and grew into three projects, uh, a book, a film, and a text. So, uh, the idea for a book rests on the nature of the printed word. The book is an extension of the visual faculty as expressed to the art of typography. The repeatability of print calls for a spatial structure within the frame of a page. With the book, language becomes an object. The writing of content and the construction of form intertwine. The idea for a film rests on the oral tradition of language. In speech, we tend to react to each situation that occurs, reacting in tone and gesture even to our own act of speaking. By contrast, the written word spells out in sequence what is quick and implicit in the spoken word. The film is a juxtaposition of language and image and is an opportunity to examine the line between fiction and reality in architecture. Uh, the idea for texts then uh, rests on the definition as provided by uh, Rowan Barthes uh, as uh, impossible to contain, operating across a dispersed web of standard plots and received ideas. The text is a network. This project involves the infiltration of language directly into the city. Um, writing then is but one format language can take. One form that has the possibility to hybridize with others, yet unique to writing, or at least from a Western point of view, is the phonetic alphabet. There have been many kinds of writing, pictographic and syllabic, but there is only one phonetic alphabet in which semantically meaningless letters are used to correspond to semantically meaningless sounds. The result of this separation is an intensification and extension of the visual faculty. Writing is a visual abstraction that occupies the space of a page. <laughs> Writing itself might be considered a spatial discipline. Um, so, in his book, uh, Words in Building, Adrian Forty describes a number of differences between the nature of language and drawing. Uh, one of his remarks is that drawings are exact and language is vague. And it is true that language can allow for an ambiguity that is difficult to replicate with a drawing board. Um, however, I suppose I prefer to think of this ambiguity as resting not on, on the vagaries of language, but on its ability to embody multiple and precise meanings. Uh, I, I, personally, anyway, I believe in those rare moments where a single word can define an entire project. And my own experience in this regard is, is one of chance, of, of re-educating myself in a vocabulary I once knew, but the meaning of which I never really understood. So this is just an image from my fifth year dissertation, uh, which was a study of the representation and reproduction of bazaars at the time of its construction uh, through contemporary Irish architecture journals. And it was while researching this that I came across an article on the building in the Irish Architecting Contractor, uh, which was in Irish. Uh, so I read it uh, slowly and confused, and eventually came to the word uh, egg, egg four, and I didn't know it, so I looked it up, and um, I should have known it, but it can mean to bound, limit, or edge. It's also, and uh, I could get this completely wrong, I'm not a linguist, but it's also the root of fordiv, which is, I suppose, a much more familiar word, which is a building. But of course, in Irish, fordiv is not a building in the sense that it is defined as a thing that is built. It is a th thing that is bound. And um, it was only afterwards that I realized that this concept of a structure that was no more than boundary was in fact what I had actually been searching for in my thesis, uh, well, of which this is just an, one image from it, which is just a hurling wall. And that's really all I was seeking was to focus on the construction of walls in these suburban uh, kind of semi-leftover green spaces. And, and the idea of even applying a function or a roof to it, or any sense that a building in that meaning of the word was even necessary, uh, wasn't what I was actually interested in. 
And but the, it was the concept of four nymph made it clear what I wanted to find and how I might look for it. And so in this sense, I was writing influence design. And uh, I suppose my other example is perhaps more unique to the medium of writing. Um, so this is uh, Tua, uh, which is a magazine about Dublin's uh, suburbs, which was, uh, so was shortlisted recently in the IAS Archazine Ar competition. And uh, or I don't know exactly where I came up with the name, but it's essentially a bilingual play on words which relies on both the visual and audio faculties. So um, the explanation goes, um, its visual manifestation makes reference to contemporary standards of land measurement and definition, as in two hectares. However, the pronunciation is the same as the Irish word tua, for which there is perhaps no direct English translation. It refers simultaneously to both the people and the land they inhabit. The inability to separate the two is key to our own understanding of the city. We believe that in the modern suburb, the land and the way it is used is still inextricably linked to the people that use it. So this is a deliberate attempt, I suppose, to incorporate a broad range of precise meanings into a single word. And if you don't mind my, my uh, somewhat uh, shameless uh, <laughs> self-promotion, uh, we're hoping to get it published properly. So it is, it is up on, uh, or will be by tomorrow anyway, up uh, on Funders, and the website will be up and everything like that. And, uh, and if you want to know more, <coughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, the last chapter, I suppose. Um, so, in Species of Spaces, uh, George Perec's collection of essays on an ever expanding scale of space, chapter one is dedicated to the page. The written word occupies the page and cannot be divorced from it. Writing is a spatial practice. But Perec's work is an example in more ways than one. Since there's little value in writing about architecture per se, it offers an alternative approach, one which I think is far more useful to pursuing writing as a part of the design process. It offers the idea of structure. The book itself is ordered from small to big, from page to space. Each chapter then deals with its topic according to its own style and logic. Other publications by Craig and his Olipo uh, colleagues follow more complex patterns uh, based on lipograms, palindromes, and univocalism. And some of this may appear incredibly arbitrary, and I, and I certainly don't recommend that anyone should attempt to form their 8,000 word dissertation into a, a palindrome. But to some extent, I suppose all structure is arbitrary, and the important thing is that the order is applied consciously. Not as a straitjacket before a word is written, but as something that emerges through the process of editing. So just some examples here as well, and uh, this is the book that was produced uh, for that writing is building, uh, which I also have a copy of saying and is has that urge to look through it. But um, so I mean, I, I, I was originally even skeptical of this idea. I wouldn't personally uh, merge quite so literally, I suppose, uh, writing with imagery like this. But uh, the student in this case, actually, and I really, I really love this one. Was um, it's just a, an image, and it's a reconstructed image, so it's not a real photograph, it's like almost a layering collage of photographs. And then each of these buildings almost become personalities, and they start to tell a story. And uh, these lists of characters, and uh, in, in that sort of sense, and, and again, it's just emerging, it's a very spatial thing, it's emerging of, uh, and it's, I suppose it's writing in a sense, to me almost at its purest, because it can't be translated. You know, it doesn't make sense in any other form except as a piece of writing on occupying a page. And another one is this, which is actually based on a movie. Well, I like that the person, it's almost a script, but you can see the seconds have been left in. So this should take 45 seconds or 30 seconds or whatever it is. But there's something nice about just how it's visually organized and the way those insertion of seconds. I actually almost prefer this to the actual movie. And, and some, something about the medium itself and what it embodies, I think, is kind of important. And this one, then, I suppose, the final one is my, probably my favorite in that it's a very simple idea is that the, the student just took out the word space and left a space in its place. But by doing so, and I wasn't aware of this until after I read it and he told me, but 
but you find yourself occupying that space with your own words, I kind of found originally, and whatever seems to suit the paragraph which is being described, but it's actually always the same space that's being described in each instance. And so again, it's just an example of, it might be an arbitrary structure in one way, but it can be very useful, very helpful, and again, it's very much a key and unique to the medium of writing itself. So, uh, just to finish, um, and perhaps it's simply the result of, of five years of, of brainwashing, but I don't see a huge difference between the process of writing and designing. Uh, we sketch, we draw, and we make models. We write, we type, and make publications. If not always in that sequence, the significance of both is the way of thinking we choose to apply. If we approach it with an architectural understanding, then writing is building, and it's possible to construct a city. Thanks.
out and that sort of thing, then the reading I was doing, because I had this prejudiced notion about um, space being open and space being democratic, um, I was challenged to read around that and realise that what I thought about democratic was something completely different because um, really your spaces depend on the public, so it means something different to um, the Tocqueville in America than it does to the Greeks and it means something different to the situationists. And, um, again, the things that uh, I can bring to the discussion, it all um, kind of... So my dissertation was a hodgepodge of loads of different thoughts from different times that shoved together into a very imperfect work. But it was a good chance for me to uh, try and go back doing some critical uh, reading. Uh, which was good because, as I explained, at the time I hadn't uh, done that before. Okay. So I think I'm not actually sure if that's even in the slide. So my third year dissertation then probably did follow me uh, into fourth and fifth year. And ideas about openness <coughs> and private and about um, ceremony and experiencing the public. Uh, when I moved to fourth year, um, it was a very prescribed site and a very brief and we didn't have to make a building and have to uh, be to a certain standard that was required of the people who don't want to get that. And so I took the opportunity to read about um, the I, I consider my fourth year reading the reading you should be doing kind of the ticking boxes to say yeah I've read this thing. Um, and it was definitely Here, really Thoreau and um, Tim Robinson, who are cited in the book, uh, yeah. So I'm a big fan of Tim Robinson. Uh, it's kind of, and although he never featured in uh, reference in any of my essays, he would always be in the bibliography. And um, at the beginning of my fifth year, I got to the NUIG holding a conference about him, and it was two day and a symposium designed to the Jewish theatre, and it was a really Understanding of writing and like the richness and potential of that, a lot of that can come back to that day in Galway because um, things that came up that day were talking about the difference between writing and speech, and uh, writing really is rewriting and rewriting and rewriting, and it's only through that can you get clarity and understanding and the thing really um, put, be put together in the form of what it is. And, all these different things at one time, but when you rewrite and rewrite, you get to that. So, um, when it came to doing my fifth year thesis, um, I also, I took part in the classes I mentioned earlier, the um, experimental research and uh, writing description. Um, they're they're kind of, they're that torturous sort of class that Shannon uh, spoke about when we were being dragged over the line um, with um, radical description, there was three of us in the class. The class was a telephone book of writing or readings to be done. You had a week to do it. And then once you went to class, it was just the three of you and your lecturer. And there was no slides, no nothing. It was so you sit down and you chat about it. And the general understanding is you won't have understand the reading because it talks. It's really um, I can't even begin to remember the content, but I know there was Ago as well, because I think you sat in on some of them, but everything like uh, empiricism and Ronald Boyle and um, Hook and just everything, and it's really intense. You know, so there's only three of you, there's no more time to you really have to engage with the text. Um, and it kind of helps you find your voice a lot. So I think um, you can kind of tell who the three people who took that class were because from then on, they were definitely more vocal in. Um, No, 
emails to our letter every second week and he would email us back kind of kind of tic-tacking and uh, he helped enforce that idea of rewriting and rewriting and pushing us off in different directions and we were definitely encouraged not to synthesize but as part of thesis you have to synthesize so this is what my thesis was uh, at our Christmas time uh, so I probably should have been a bit more solid by then but often uh, and everything um, but you kind of have to trust the process that eventually <coughs> come together um, as I said earlier my thesis was definitely I was drawing what I was writing to a huge extent so I was interested in the um, great democratisation that had been happening with the Arab Spring so I would try and draw that <coughs> in Egypt. I was also interested in the um, change in Nogi governance structures, so I tried to draw that flow, how a place is bounded by the genius of boundaries, it kind of means nothing because it's urban um, population that live outside that boundary, so how that affects things. Um, because I was looking at, um, at kind of uh, textiles and how um, you know, Greek ideas of craft sewing drawings, um, but uh, some then juxtaposing writings about our readings about you know Iris and uh, Greek democracy and Socrates on top of my site, and then beginning to draw that, and that is kind of how I form the thesis. Um, so that's that, and then so once you have written something, it's there and it's um, you know concise enough that it can go off. Thank you. 
education allowed for the reader and the volumes of the user in the process, or is it really about emphasizing on the author or the authorship or the <laughs> <laughs> Um
sometimes you kind of you kind of get lucky. I mean, it's even worse sometimes to you know sometimes you're reading a book and that book quotes another one, and you're just kind of like, oh, that's a great quote. That's almost work going to the source. I find anyway. That's how I came across some of the better writings that I came across, and I thought, well, actually, this book is better than the book I was reading originally. You know? <laughs> And then once you get into the thing, 